Hey art nerds, so today I have a really fun tutorial for you. We're going to be making a really really cute cat girl waitress paper child. I have another paper child tutorial coming up that I hope you guys will check out. That's gonna have some more advanced techniques than what we're gonna use here. This is kind of the basic model. So the original tutorial was recorded as part of an art workshop live here on the channel and it ended up going on for quite a while. So I promised the attendees that I would finish the assembly off screen and then share it as soon as possible. So that's part of what this video is. You can download this line art from Gumroad. It's a $2 purchase. It includes a color version and a black and white version. My wonderful pay, uh, art nerds on Patreon have it to download for free. And this is the original base sketch that we're going to be starting with. So she is a real cutie. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to pencil these blue lines that I've printed onto Strathmore 300 series Bristol paper. When you're making paper children, you want to work with a heavier paper. That's going to give you the rigidity necessary for your paper child to be able to stand pretty much on their own. And I'm just penciling this A so you guys can see it a little bit better when we're inking it. And also to make some corrections as I go along. So for many paper children types, you need a bit of a base so they can stand on their own. I have a decorative base with fruit on it and I used a ruler just to make sure that it was squared up. So here is our penciled illustration. Next we're going to ink it. And we're going to ink it using Tombow's Furenosuke brush pins. We have several colors here. We're doing color line art which is gonna look a little bit garish at first, but once we start coloring it with our alcohol markers, it'll just kind of blend in. It's gonna look really cool. So I'm using blue, red, purple, and pink. Um, her dress and her hair bows are going to be teal, so I'm inking those with blue. Her hair, her ears, and her tail are going to be orange, so she's like a little ginger tabby cat. So I'm gonna ink those with red. You could also use orange or you could use yellow if you want. For her skin, I'm going to use pink because we're going for a lighter cast of skin tone. And then we're using the purple to add some shadows here and there. Now, one of the cool things about the Tombow Furenosuke pins is they are waterproof and copic proof. You guys might remember that I inked the mermaid illustration that we did for our mermaid workshop with these. I really liked how that turned out, so it's a technique I definitely wanted to revisit. When it comes to making paper children, you're absolutely not limited to say watercolor or alcohol marker. You can color them with Crayola markers if that's what you have handy. You could use crayons if you want. You could do it all digital and then print it out. It's really up to you. What's most important is the fact that we're creating a two-dimensional figure that can exist in a 3D space 
rather than the materials that we use to create it with. The only thing I would point out is that you do want to work with a heavier paper. If you're doing it digitally and then you're printing it out, I would recommend printing it onto cardstock. Or you may want to go ahead and glue your illustration to a piece of chipboard. You could actually use um, an unused or an empty cereal box for that and some Elmer's glue and just apply a really even layer of glue and allow it to dry fully overnight. We also used a little bit of Sakura Pigma FB to ink the bottoms of her shoes since those are going to be black, as well as the base since it's kind of a neutral color. And then I'm just going in with the purple and I'm using that to add a little bit of shadow here and there. So we have our paper child inked. Like I mentioned, if you just want to color this, if you don't want to worry about inking it or drawing it yourself and you just want to enjoy coloring it and assembling a paper child, you can download two versions of this line art from Gumroad. It's just $2 or you can join me over on Patreon. Pledges start at just a dollar a month and you're going to get access to so many awesome things. Every time I create a line art for one of our art workshops, my art nerds get it first so they can print it out and they can color along during the workshop. Next, we're going to start swatching the alcohol markers that we want to use. And I have selected a wide array of alcohol markers from different brands. We have Neopico, we have Curacolor, we have Copic, we have Prismacolor, and we have some Blick Studio brush markers because I'm not brand loyal. I'm really just looking for brush markers that perform well and play nicely with one another. So this list of colors is not totally inclusive because I did end up having to pick out and swatch some additional colors during the stream. But the main colors I used for this are Curacolor 416, Copic E00, Neo Pico 405, Copic R01, Copic E93, Copic E34, Prismacolor PB95, uh, Copic R02, Copic E95, Copic Y18, Prismacolor PB122, Prismacolor PB14, Prismacolor PB13, Copic E08, Copic Filled with Rangers Sunshine Yellow, Copic E87, Copic BG23, Prismacolor PB37, Prismacolor, or I'm sorry, Copic BG49, Blick Studio Brush Marker 017, Copic B00, Copic B000, Copic B214, Neo Pico 282, Copic B37, Copic YG00, Blick Studio Brush Marker E32, uh, 032, 
Blick Studio Brush Marker 042, and BG13, that's a Copic, as well as a few additional colors. So anytime I'm working with alcohol markers, it's really important for me to swatch my colors and I'll often number them as you can see here. So I have um, them separated out into where they're going to be used. So like the skin tones, the blush tones, freckles, her hair color, her dress color, her shoe color, the shadows on her eyes, and her actual eye color. Then I number those colors in terms of when they're gonna be used and I scratch out the colors I'm definitely not going to use because they may clash with the color scheme that I have in mind. And then I keep my swatch sheet handy. When I'm recording alcohol marker tutorials, I also list the names of the markers and the brands so that I can read them off to you guys later on. So I have all the markers that I'm going to be using to color her in order laid out next to me. This switch in angle indicates that we started the stream. So my main streaming camera gets the point place of pride, the topmost uh, mic arm, and then my cell phone, which I use to record these tutorials, gets delegated to the five and below cell phone arm. So that explains kind of the weird angle. I have a lot of alcohol marker tutorials here on this channel. I think you'll enjoy some of them. We had some really excellent questions pop up during the chat. One of them was that the person who is asking the question, um, I think it was Honey Bear, said that their skin tones always end up kind of blotchy and kind of orange. And one of the things I want to point out is as I was reading my colors, there were a lot of different brands. When you're buying alcohol markers in a pre-designed set listed from that company, sometimes their idea of what a skin tone is is not really what we would consider in the US to be a natural skin tone. So for example, a lot of manga artists will use kind of orange colors and they'll just color the shading on the face rather than where the light source is hitting the face. So the main body of the face is gonna be like the color of the paper because the light's hitting it and then the marker they're using is only for the shadow. So it using an oranger color kind of makes sense for that. But when you're working differently with alcohol markers when you're covering more of the face it's really important to have as many skin tones as possible so when you're buying them in store swatch them i bought most of my skin tones open stock and um even before you use your alcohol marker swatch them and just try to get as much practice as possible and one of the things that can cause blotchiness with alcohol markers is and there's a lot of factors. You could be working on a really thin paper and then that thin paper is on a non-absorbent surface like a glass tabletop or a craft mat or even just some plastic sheeting. So the alcohol ink soaks through really quick and then it pools underneath. Um, you could be working on a coated marker paper. Those tend to only take like three layers of marker before they get really weird. Um, I like to work on really thick absorbent papers. So I work a lot on Bristol, on cardstock, on watercolor paper, like uh, cellulose watercolor paper, but I don't really like the coated marker papers for how I handle markers because I do a lot of layers and I do a lot of blending. I also wanna point out that this video has been time-lapsed several times to make sure it's short enough, but I talk about the coloring portion and how I'm coloring and what colors I'm using when and why I'm using them a lot in the main body of the live stream. Now, I had a lot of streaming issues on Monday evening, so I'll link all instant, wait, actually, I may have, no, I think I have the main body of the live stream still up. So I'll link those for you guys in the description below. So um, I started with the skin tone or with the skin for her and I got a little bit out of order. So I applied Curricolor Color 416 first. It's the lightest of our colors. Then I went in with Neopico C405, which is actually the darkest of the skin tones or one of the darker of the skin tones that I selected. I blended that back out a little bit with E00 by Copic. So we have a softer transition in the skin tone. And then I started applying some of the blush colors. So R01, first on the cheeks, the lips, above the eyes, the elbows, etc. Um, and then I applied E93. After that, I used E11 to add some shadows to the skin, but I didn't get as much contrast as I really wanted for that. For her freckles, I applied E34 
and PB95. I started with E34, let that dry, and then applied PB95 because freckles, if you notice, you get varying darknesses of freckles. Some, sometimes they fade and then the newer ones are much darker. So it's nice to kind of build up those layers. For her hair, I started with a really light base color because when you're rendering oranges for hair, they can get kind of fake and synthetic and I wanted something that felt a little bit more realistic. I also want to point out that I decided to go with a little orange tabby because my cat Remy, who was an orange tabby manx, passed away last year and whenever I draw cat girls, I just always think of Remy. So um, this is kind of a nice way to memorialize my girl. She was 17. She wasn't a young cat, but she did die of oral cancer that could have been prevented if her vet had caught it early enough. So one of the ways I keep her memory alive is if you have a cat that you love, please do ask your vet to do a thorough oral examination because oral cancer is obviously not fun. And it's a really sad way to go. So for her hair, I started with um, a custom filled Copic marker, Peach Bellini. It's a really light kind of skin tone color, but it works well as sort of the base highlight for her hair. Then I did a layer of Copic Y18, which is kind of a yellow color. And for hair, Unlike with skin, where I apply all the layers in quick succession so we get these soft blends, I allow the layers between the hair application to dry so that we get a stronger trans, um, transition and that way we get a sharper highlight. Next, I applied PB120, or, yeah, PB122 and then PB114, so we're sort of going into the orange territory. Then I applied PB13, so we're going more red and then E08. And then way later in the tutorial, I decided that I wasn't getting enough contrast and enough shadow to her hair. So in the very back shadows, I applied Copic Burnt Sienna, and I don't remember the color number for that. But basically we went from um, yellow to orange to brown when rendering her hair. For her shoes, I wanted her to have like dark blue, almost blue black shoes. So I started with, I want to say either B000 or B00. Then after that dried, because I want them to be really shiny, I did a layer of B24, and that's Copic B24. Then I did a layer of Copic B37. And then finally, I did a layer of Neo Pico. 283. So we're building up that blue shade as well. For her dress, I wanted her to have like a really cute teal dress. I thought that would make the orange in her hair pop a little bit more. So I started with BG23 and then blended in a layer of BG13 while it was still wet and then blended that back out to soften the transition with our first color BG23. Then I applied a layer of Copic BG49. So that's like duck blue. That's a cooler, bluer shade of teal. And then I went in with PB37. And then finally Blick Studio 017. So I'm working progressively darker and bluer with the teal as we go. And I'm trying to create some really nice cast shadow. For her bows, I think I started with the second color so Copic BG13 and just work darker from there that way it wouldn't be too matchy matchy for her eyes I really wanted so Rem's eyes were the same color as her fur they were orangey um, but I wanted like really piercing kind of bright green eyes and you guys can see me referencing my swatch sheet here so I started with a really light bright yellow green Copic's YG00 then I did a layer while that was still wet leaving the bottom uncolored, or rather the bottom still with the YG00, like a little crescent moon. I did a layer of Blick Studio 032 in kind of a circular motion. And then I did Blick Studio 042. And while that was still really wet, I went in with Copic BG13, which is kind of a teal color. 
and I did like um, a circular shape at the tops of her eyes underneath that shiny. For her irises, I actually didn't go black. I went with teal colors. So I used Prismacolor PB37 and Blick Studio Brush 017 for that. For the orange, I have to apologize here because for the fruit and for the refreshments that she's holding on the tray, I kind of went off the grid and I started swatching and not necessarily writing down the swatch colors because I was talking to the chat and engaging the chat. And um, sometimes I cannot chew gum and walk at the same time. So we'll just leave it at that. But I was really looking for colors that would feel very fresh and vibrant. And I really wanted to build up those colors in the fruit so that we have this kind of juicy, shiny translucency. So you can see I'm picking the colors right now for the cherries and for the blueberries. For the orange, I started with warmer yellows, a lot of the same colors I used in her hair. I used on the uh, orange with the addition of a few more synthetic oranges that I picked and swatched just because I wanted it to be brighter than her hair. You can see I'm adding that burnt sienna to the shadows of her hair at this point because I kind of sat on it for a while and I was like, I really want to delineate that hair that's in the shadow and have that pushed back, have that recessed into the background more. So for the cherry and well, rather for the blueberry, I'm starting with a really dark blue. I think I'm using iris blue for this. So it's like a blue that's almost purple. And then I'm going to put a really dark red violet on top of that because blueberries, at least here in the US, they aren't really blue they're more of like a dark dark purple and then the mold they get on them that gives it kind of a bluer cast then for the cherry i start with like r triple zero so a really 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 light uh pink and then i went in with i want to say like either coral or prawn while it was still wet so we get the diffuse blend i blend some of that out with the r triple zero and then i'm i think i use like strong red and then a red violet after that so I'm going from a very light pink all the way to a much darker, more saturated red violet, something that's trending toward blue to build up that shadow as we move away from the light source. And then for the desserts, I wanted to use some of the same colors that I used in the rest of the piece just to kind of pull it together. I also wanted to go a little bit pinker with some of the desserts so that they kind of match what's going on in her ears. And I didn't want to go with anything since she is so bright with the orange and the teal and the bright green. I didn't want the dessert she was holding to be too distracting. So I went with like vanilla ice cream with like cherry candies, a chocolate cupcake, and then like Neapolitan ice cream, except the top layer is more of like a lemon, strawberry and chocolate, which probably wouldn't go together very well. Now for the glass, um, originally I inked that with blue and I colored it in using, well, I colored the contours of it using BG triple zero leaving the interior kind of white or the white of the paper. And then I added further shadows with B double zero. And then to imply um, translucency, I just added a little bit of the color in the bottom. If you guys are actually interested in learning how to paint translucent objects, let me know down in the comments below and I'll do a whole tutorial on that because um, it's actually a very simple technique that looks quite impressive. So here is our finished paper child, or rather she has been markered. But the next step is to add a little bit of gouache, a little bit of white highlights. You don't have to use gouache for this. You could use white gel pen. You could use white color, watercolor, kind of just whatever you like to use. I like using white gouache just to add some of those highlights in.
So at this point, she is colored. She just needs to be cut out and assembled. I went ahead and I scanned her. And at this point, the live stream had hit the three hour mark. Everybody was kind of tired. So I decided to finish this tutorial off live stream, which is kind of a shame since the point of the workshop was to teach people how to construct paper children. So the materials you're gonna need at this point are you're gonna need a cutting mat, um, or you can use the chipboard back of a sketchbook. You might wanna have an X-Acto blade handy, especially if you are capable of handling one. You want a pair of scissors. You want a selection of adhesives. I would recommend staying away from really wet glues like Elmer's glue because it's going to cause the paper to buckle. Double stick tape is great. Removable or permanent tape runners are great. Scotch tape is great. Masking tape works well in certain instances. Glue sticks work well and paper craft glue also work well for this. And I'm going to have links down in the description below to all the materials. So this is one of the paper children that I made in a different paper children tutorial. Very similar in design where we're going to use a triangular base to provide most of the support. So the first thing I'm doing is I want to get as many straight line cuts as possible. Normally I would use my paper cutter to help facilitate this. I'm just going to use a ruler with the inking edge and an X-Acto blade. So we want to remove as much excess paper as possible and leaving some of that excess paper to um, just to make it a little bit easier to handle, we're going to cut out all of the smaller fine fiddly bits. So you want to leave some paper around the paper child at this point because it does provide a lot of extra structural support. You're not going to have as many problems with tearing, with bending, with warping while you cut out these smaller fiddly bits. If you have a pair of really sharp fine scissors, they would probably work for this. I've had a lot of trouble with that in the past, so it's easier for me to just use my X-Acto blade. And I'm also using the X-Acto blade just to kind of pre-cut any area Areas that I know are going to be difficult for me to get my scissors into. So now I'm using the scissors to do um, a tight cut, a, not a, I think it's called a kiss cut, where we're going up as close to the line art as possible and we're removing as much paper as we can. You can do a halo cut where you leave some of the white around the figure. If you're less confident with scissors or if you have some mobility issues, you can do that. It's still gonna look really cute when you're finished. Okay, so now we have our paper child all cut out. You can see we still have the base. In some areas, I didn't attempt a, a kiss cut. I did a halo cut. It was just easier for me to navigate that. So the first thing I'm doing is I am constructing our triangular base, and I'm going to use some double stick tape to hold our base in place. Now she's larger than some of the paper children I've made, so she's going to need a larger base in order to be sturdy. So I'm adhering two of the straight cut pieces of Bristol and then trimming them down, folding them into a triangle and then using double stick tape and masking tape to adhere that. So she herself needs some structural support. So I'm gonna use some Bristol cut really, really thin. You can use, um, for this, you could use a straw, you could use a pipe cleaner, you could use popsicle sticks, you could use toothpicks. You don't have to actually use the cut paper. You could use some wire. It's just to help prevent her from bending over if like the wind blows. So I double stack that. And now I'm adding a thicker core of Bristol that's gonna go down at the bottom. And then also at her feet just to prevent her from bending over. So this takes some trial and error and it takes a little bit of engineering, but it's actually one of the more fun parts for me. <laughs> I'm gonna add some additional structural support for her head. And I'm also gonna use some masking tape on the Bristol spine we just built just to make sure it doesn't separate from the body and to provide additional support. So the main key here is to reinforce areas that are gonna be likely to catch on things that are going to be likely to bend that may catch on the wind. So next we're going to use a larger piece of our scrap bristle to start building the 
space. And this is where we're going to use a lot of the masking tape to kind of hold it in place and to provide additional structural support. So I folded a piece of tape in half and I used it to adhere the base to the inside bottom. And then I'm going to also run pieces of tape across the bottom, as you can see here, overlapping it and looping it to the inside. You may want to decorate this base. You may want to find a way to integrate it with a paper child using something cute. I am going to use some coins wrapped in masking tape just to provide weights to help keep her upright. So I'm sorting them out so that they're the same size and roughly the same weight. I'm going to bundle two together and then wrap tape around that and then use tape to adhere it to the base. And this is going to help keep her from tipping over. So here is our finished paper child. She's a real cutie. I had so much fun working on her. I have a companion piece in the works where it is a mouse girl waitress. So I hope you guys will join me for that. Making paper children is a great way to take your 2D art into the 3D space and it gives you a whole different way to interact with your art. These can also be a lot of fun for imaginative play. You can create dioramas and stage them and use them to tell stories. So I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I want to thank those of you who joined me for the live workshop and I look forward to sharing more art tutorials with you guys. If you're looking for more alcohol marker tutorials, I'll have some of my favorites linked down in the description below. If you like what I do and you want to help support it, you can join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Have a wonderful day guys. Bye!